Hello, everyone. So, one of the major new features of Rails 7 was the asset pipeline, which brought with it, like David mentioned earlier, a no-build front-end development, and at the same time, better integration with the Node ecosystem. And that's great for us developers. After all, we are always looking for ways to improve our development experience and to build better user experiences. But to do that, we had to introduce multiple new gems, some of which seem to have overlapping features, some of which seem to depend on one another. And that has caused some confusion, which is not so good for us developers, because we don't want to spend days migrating gems just to find out we chose the wrong gems and we have to start, start over again. But don't, don't worry, it's not that difficult. All you have to do is ask yourself one simple question, and the answer to that question will show you which gems you should be using. But to understand the question and the answer, first we need to, need to understand what makes the new asset pipeline so different from the previous asset pipeline. And we will do this first by taking a look at the problems that the original asset pip pipeline was trying to solve. Then we'll take a look at all the new technologies for the, of the past 10 years that made many of those features unnecessary, before finally taking a look at PropShaft and why it's the heart of the new asset pipeline. So, section one. When I say asset pipeline, what I mean is a collection of features and techniques that together answer two questions about front-end development. How do I make my pages load faster? And how do I make my code more maintainable? And for the original asset pipeline, that meant transpilation, which is converting co source code from one language to another, bundling, which was taking many small files and concatenating it into a large file, fingerprinting, which was ensuring that the name of the file changes when the content of the file changes, and compression, which is reducing the size of the file that will, be that will be delivered to the user. And all those features use it to be implemented by sprockets alone, which is why for many years, sprockets and asset pipeline were synonym. Okay, but why do we need transpilation? Back when the original asset pipeline was released, we were barely get getting support for CSS 2.1, and it did not have support for import, for variables or for nesting, which are three things that make uh, CSS code a lot more maintainable. And fun fact, it also had no support for border radius. And I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person old enough to have used images to simulate rounded corners here. So CSS3, which came later, still did not have support for nesting, which is why we had SAS, which had support for all those things and could be transpiled into CSS. To understand the impact of SAS, all we have to do is take a look at this code in plain CSS and compare it with this code in SAS. The SAS code is less verbose, it has structure, and the use of variables better reveal what the values mean. The situation with JavaScript was even worse. We were half a decade away from ES6, and even ES5 was not fully supported yet. And yes, ES5 is where Methods like for each and map, which we all use all the time, were introduced. So it's no wonder that we are reaching for SAS and CoffeeScript to make our development experience better. So that was transpilation. What about bundling? Bundling is both maintainability and performance. The first is pretty obvious. Would you rather work in a single file that is thousands of lines long? or dozens of small fi smaller files where it's easier to find the code you want and easier to collaborate with others. The problem with having ma that many small files is that HTTP 1 had a limitation where each connection could only make a single request at a time. So imagine you have four files. You establish the connection, you request the file, the server finds it and gives it, sends it back. Then you do it again and again, and again, before closing the connection. And you see this, this is extra latency. This back and forth between client and server is making it take longer for your page to be ready. And when you have dozens of files, it's not looking very good, is it? Obvious solution, open multiple connections, and your browser is going to say, sure, up to eight. So you take pen and paper, you use basic math, 
and you figure out you're still going to be doing a lot of round trips. And the final nail in the coffin is that CSS and JavaScript are render blocking. This means your browser is not going to hand, render anything until it has all the files. And your client, your user, is staring at a blank page. So by bundling all CSS into a single file and all JavaScript into a single file, you avoid all those extra round trips. Fingerprinting, however, is only about performance. The basic, the basic rule about assets is that you want to tell the browser to not download every asset each time you change pages. You want to tell it, if you have already downloaded this asset, do not download it again. And we do that with the cache control header, which we set to one, week, one year. So as long as the browser still has the file and it's not been one year, it will not download the file again. And that's fine for things like logos, which almost never change, but not for CSS and JavaScript, because if the browser is waiting for a year to download the file again, we are going to have some problems. So what you do is that every time the content changes, you change the, the name. And the best way to automate this is to ask your asset pipeline to generate a digest of the content and append it to the name so that when the content changes, so does the digest and so does the name. Small problem though, CSS files often reference typefaces and images which are going to change name. So we had to use asset helpers to make sprockets adjust the, the names for us. Finally, we had compression, which once again is all about performance. Compression started with minification, which is the removal of all line breaks, uh, white space, and comments from your files. And then we went to gzipping, which is compressing the file before sending it to the client. And these two together can take a file that was almost 100 kilobytes large down to 14 kilobytes, which is a pretty big difference when you consider that at that time, mobile phones were stuck in 3G. So this is what the original asset pipeline looked like. So what changed? Well, ES6 supports is here. Everyone who's visiting your website is using a browser that supports it. We also saw the rise of, CS, uh, of utility for CSS frameworks, like, like Tailwind. In these frameworks, instead of having all your components ready, they give you hundreds of classes that have one or two selectors and expect you to combine all those classes to create your components. So what you would, you would do in Rails is that you, you would create your own form builder so that when you created a form, your fields would have those classes. You would combine that with help, view helpers and partials to create your own custom type, type uh, design system so that even developers who don't know a leak of CSS can simply render those partials or call those helpers to build their pages. And if you still want to write CSS code, like David said they are doing, we finally have nesting. So if we don't have to write CSS or we are writing pure CSS instead of CSS and we are writing pure JavaScript, we don't need transpiling. Another thing that is widely available now is HTTP2, which removes the limitation of HTTP1 and allows a single connection to make up to 100 requests at a time. So instead of this, we now have this. And bundling is no longer necessary. In fact, bundling now is an anti-pattern. Because if you don't bundle and you change a file, your client only downloads a small file instead of a large bundle. Fingerprinting, however, is still needed. And in fact, it's much harder because of the rise of single page applications. You see, we now have JavaScript code referencing assets in all sorts of ways. For example, you have the JavaScript import, the node require, and bundle weirdness, each, each one choosing how they are going to use that. We try to solve that by taking Webpack and creating Webpacker so that out of the box, we had access to the node ecosystem and at the same time fingerprinting. 
And then the JavaScript community, fast-paced as they are, looked at that and said, great, can you do the same for rollup? And yes, build. And maybe boom. And we're looking at that and thinking, yeah, this one gem per bundle approach is not going to work. So fingerprinting, still needed, but we had to do it better. And finally, CDNs like Cloudflare are offering as part of their free services automatic compression. So they see up an asset, they generate both a gzip and a broadly version of that asset. Take a look at which version the browser supports and serve the smallest one. So compression no longer needed. In summary, for the new asset pipeline, we drop transpiling, we drop bundling, we keep fingerprinting, but we make it better. We don't want asset helpers anymore so that uh, node packages work out of the box. And we want to handle the JavaScript fingerprinting either using port maps or letting the bundlers handle it. We drop compression and we add better integration with bundlers. So section three, we knew exactly what we had, what we had to do but we were facing a problem that every programmer who has worked with production has faced before. Do we keep updating sprockets or do we start over? Well, sprockets has served as well, but it's, it carries with it 15 years of history, thousands of commits by hundreds of developers, and a lot of code for things that were no longer used or that we are now considering unnecessary. So we made our choice, and on the 18th of September of 2021, PropChef was born. Now, take a look at the first commit message, which I highlighted, and then go look up at the commit times. What you're seeing is a modern Rails gem being built step by step. And because you know exactly what we are trying to build and the traps we are trying to avoid, this is an excellent learning opportunity. If you take the time to read the message and open the commit, which is going to be six, seven, eight lines long, you can not only see the design decisions as they are made, but also understand why they are being made. And you, you, you will eventually reach this commit, which is version 021, after about 100 commits. That's the first version we deploy to production. And that's how simple PropShaft is. 100 commits, less than two months, and it replaced sprockets in a production app, a production monolith, serving thousands of ass assets to millions of users every month. And how does it do does that? Well, it all starts here. When your application boots, PropShaft will configure itself and assign to this variable an instance of its most important class, the assembly. Just like every road leads to Rome, so does every asset code leads to assembly. And from assembly, we have access to every prop shaft feature. The load path, which contains the paths to all assets we have. And notice, Sprockets use it, uh, relies on a manifest file that you have to write by hand for it to find your assets. PropChef doesn't do that. PropChef automatically knows where all your files are and adds it to the, to the assets. The resolver, which is responsible for finding the file you want. The server, used only in development, responsible for serving that, those files. The processor, which handles clean, clobber, and pre-compile tasks. And the compilers, which read CSS and JavaScript files and updates uh, references to assets with their digested names. The easiest way to understand how all those features work together is to take a look at the life cycle of an asset. And we are going to start here. Your view is asking Rails, not PropShap, that's a Rails helper, it's asking Rails to create the link tag for a style sheet named application. And this is the result you want with the fingerprint. Notice Sprockets by default does not add fingerprints to development. PropChef does. That increases parity between development and production and makes it easier to detect problems before they, are, they go to production. So Rails is going to call this helper, which reaches for the assets, which is the assembly, as I said, 
and we'll ask it for the environment resolver, which in development is a dynamic resolver. That resolver will reach for the file, the load path, and ask it to find the asset name and application. The load path is going to treat application as the key to a hash. Why? Because that's what the load path is. A massive hash where asset names are the keys and instances of the asset class are the values. But how does it build that hash? Well, if you take a look here, where load path is, where the variable is instantiated, you see that it's iterating through every path where there are assets, like I said. Where do those paths come from? During, conf during initial configuration, PropShaft took a look at your application and every gen in your gen file looking for a folder named assets and added the directories in it to the passes array. And for every file it finds in each one of those paths, it creates an instance of asset. So with asset, oh, oh and that's a very expensive uh, uh, operation, as you can imagine, especially if you have like five, six, seven thousand assets. So we memoize it so that only the first request has to do it. With asset in hand, we ask it for its, its digested name, which, like I said, is generated from the content of the file. So, in summary, the view asks style sheet link tag for the application asset which in turn asks compute path for it, which reaches for the assembly and asks it for the resolver, which is dynamic since we're in developer. The resolver goes to the load path and asks it for the asset name and application. And with that asset in hand, we have the digested path. If we were in production, that would be a bit different. We, we, we would use the static resolver. And that resolver does not use the load path. It uses the manifest file. Not the manifest file we write by hand, but a manifest file that PropChef generates. And from there, it pulls a digested path. So the next step in the life cycle of an asset is when you actually request it. When your application booted, again, PropChef created an instance of the server class and assigned it to the assets route, which we are all familiar with. Server is a very small hack application. So if, if, if you've never worked directly with a, with a hack application, that's a good example of a very simple one. It works in four steps. First, it takes the, na the name of the asset you ask it and separates digest from name. Because like I said, the load path uses only the name as the key, no digests. Then it reaches for the load path and asks for the instance of asset and compiles it. Like I said, if you have this in your file, you want to have this instead. And PropChef does this automatically without the asset helper. Finally, it serves the asset with the correct header set, including the cache control header. Perfect. The hash is instantiated, digests are calculated, everything is working fine. What happens if I add a file? Because the hash is memoized, we're not going to scan the directories again. How are we going to find that, that asset? Well, in development, PropChef will add a callback to all your controllers so that every time you reload a page or you navigate to a different page, it will ask the cache sweeper to execute. The cache sweeper is a file, sorry, the cache sweeper is a file watch, a file watcher that basically watches all files we know of, and if any changes or is added or is deleted, causes the cache to be cleared, forcing the load path to scan all directories again. The final step in the lifecycle of an asset is the pre-compile step. And once again, proving the assembly is the heart of PropChef, it's going to reach for assets get the resolver, and ask it to execute. And that happens in three steps. First, we ensure that the public assets folder, which we know so well, is created. Then, we write the manifest file that, is that the static resolver will use, 
before finally moving all assets from their source folder to the public assets folder. And we compile the files while that is happening. So that's PropChef. It generates URL for our assets, serves assets in developments, and pre-compiles assets for production. There are only three small features we have to talk about. I mentioned we wanted to eliminate asset helpers. We did that by taking the CSS compiler and making it scan for every way a CSS file can reference an asset. If you check the test file, there are a lot of them. But we got all of them, and now no longer we need asset, file, uh, asset helpers. Which means if you are using something like Bootstrap from Node, it works out of the box. I also talk, talked about JavaScript fingerprinting. And there are two ways to solve this. The first, if you are using bundlers, we let the bundlers handle the digest. And if PropChef detects that the file is already digested, has a digest in the name, it will simply skip digesting it. If you are not using bundlers, then you are going to use import maps, which is basically a, a hash where module names are keys and the location to find them are the values. And finally, we wanted better integration with modern bundlers. We did, we did not want to create a gem for every bundler. So we introduced the bundling gems. JS bundling rails for bundlers like ESBuild, Rollup, and BUM, and CSS bundling rails for bundlers like Post and Dart. And they provide easy installation of the bundler of your choice. Integration with PropChat is handled by running BingDev instead of RailsS. BingDev is a process that tells the bundlers to watch for changes in their, their files, and if they notice it, compile the files and place in the builds folder, which PropChef is watching and will notice when they are placed there. So that's it. Get to the conclusion, which is, what is the question we have to ask ourselves? Well, it goes all the way back to the very first thing I told you, that Rails 7 is about no build, front-end development, or better integration with Node. So the question is, do you want Node? If you're asking this today and you say, no, I don't want Node, you're going to say, you're going to use sprockets and import maps. If you say, yes, I do want Node, then you're going to use sprockets and the bundling gens, JS bundling and CSS bundling. And when PropChef gets released, simply rep replace sprockets with PropChef. Simple as that. Thank you, everyone. That was it.